Good afternoon. My name is Pastor Jason Baldwin, and I serve your brothers and sisters in Christ at Hope in St. Charles. And it's my privilege to be with you today as we prepare our hearts to celebrate our Lord's coming and long for His coming again. Today, we will see our Lord grow up to be a priest for us, to be under God's law for us, to sacrifice for us, and to be our Savior. Open my lips, hasten to save me, O God. Lord God, you have brought us safely to this hour of evening prayer. We thank you for providing all that we need for body and life. Bless us who have gathered in your name. Forgive our sins. Speak to our hearts. Dispel our sorrows with the comfort of your word. And receive our hymns of thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let my prayer rise before you as it Let our prayer be acceptable in your sight. Come and help us in time of need, that we may sing your praise in holy joy now and forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My soul is thirsting for you. O Lord, my 
God. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, my God. You are my God, at dawn I seek you, for you my soul is thirsting, for you my flesh is pining, like a dry weary land without water. have come before you in the sanctuary to behold your strength and your glory. Your loving mercy is better than life. My lips will speak your praise. Bless you all my life. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul shall be filled as with a banquet. With joyful lips my mouth shall praise you. strength. In the shadow of your wings I rejoice. My soul clings fast to you. Your right hand upholds me. Let us pray. Lord God, grant your Holy Spirit that we may hear and believe your word. Cleanse our minds and renew our hearts that we may live for you here and hereafter. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson for consideration this afternoon is Leviticus chapter 16, beginning at verse 6. Aaron shall present the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself 
and for his household. He shall take the two male goats and stand them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Aaron is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot marked for the Lord, and the other lot marked for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring forward the goat that received the lot for the Lord to prepare it as a sin offering. But the goat that received the lot marked for the scapegoat is to be kept alive before the Lord, to make atonement upon it in order to send it off into the wilderness as the scapegoat. This is the word of our Lord. Our second lesson is recorded in the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 7, beginning at verse 26. This is certainly the kind of high priest we needed, one who is holy, innocent, pure, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices on a daily basis, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people. In fact, He sacrificed for sins once and for all when he offered himself. This is the word of the Lord. The gospel lesson for this afternoon is recorded in Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 21. These verses will also serve as our sermon text for this afternoon. After eight days passed, when the child was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be called holy to the Lord. And they came to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. This is the Gospel of our Lord.
In the name of Christ Jesus, our great high priest, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Your fellow redeemed, there's a book and a movie and even a podcast called Freakonomics, The Hidden Side of Everything. Maybe you've heard about it before. In Freakonomics, an economist looks at things in everyday life with an economist's eye for detail, analyzing statistics and data and numbers, and then draws conclusions by teasing data out of those numbers and statistics and stuff like that. I find it fascinating, um, especially one section of the book entitled, Would a Roshanda by any other name smell the same? And this whole chapter of the book is about looking at what people named their children and how it affects their lives, trends in baby naming, the most popular names, and some insane stories of bad parental choices. It's really neat, though, when you look at it, and I don't agree with all of the different conclusions that the authors draw in this section or throughout their work, but it really is provocative stuff. It gets you thinking about, well, what if, does a child's name have an effect, if any, on their future and how it's going to turn out? There's one interesting story in that section of the book about a man who performed his own twisted, homegrown psycholo- or, uh, sociological experiment with his set of sons. He named them Winner and Loser. Yeah, I know this guy is not getting any Parent of the Year awards at all. But he names them winner or loser, trying to answer the question, well, what will they be when they grow up? How are they going to turn out? Well, in fact, winner and loser did not live up to their names. Winner became a hardened criminal, while loser, who goes by the name Lou, became a decorated police officer. Today we hear about Jesus being given a name today. And we see that it's not a name given on parental whim or family tradition or popularity. It's not even one his parents chose for him. It's one that was chosen for him by God himself. And instead of, does a name affect how a person turns out? This is flipped around. Because we already know what this child is going to do and accomplish and exactly who this child is, a name is chosen that reflects that, what we already know. He's given the name Jesus, which means Savior. The Lord saves. And He lives up to that name. Today as we look at Jesus receiving that name at His circumcision and also His presentation at the temple, we're going to see the answers to the question, what will He be when He grows up? The answer in part is a priest who is under God's law for us and a priest who sheds His blood for us. Mary and Joseph were following the law when they brought Jesus, uh, to, when they had Jesus circumcised eight days after he was born. That's what happened for all faithful Hebrew families and their boys. And it was a time when a name was bestowed upon a child. Circumcision was part of the Old Testament law covenant for God's people. It was something he commanded them to do as part of that. But it also had gospel significance too because that was the outward sign that marked you as a son of the covenant, as a member of God's family. And as faithful Hebrew parents, Mary and Joseph had Jesus circumcised on that eighth day. Now, it's only one verse here. And in fact, these verses of our text are only just a few verses in all. And they can threaten to be swallowed up by what's around them. You know, the well-known second chapter of Luke with the first 20 verses is that gospel of Christmas. In those days, Caesar Augustus. 
And then after the verses of our text for today, you have that that incredible encounter that Jesus and Mary and Joseph have with the elderly Simeon and Anna in the temple. But what goes on between those things in these verses is very significant. And it begins with His circumcision. What was happening here? Jesus was putting God's plan in motion. He was under the law now as He was circumcised. He began His active obedience as our substitute and our Savior. He was under God's law. As it's told about in Galatians chapter 4, that when it was exactly the right time, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under law to redeem those under the law. And that was His purpose for being under God's law. To be our substitute, to be perfect for us. There had never been a perfect priest in Israel's history. We just heard in Leviticus how when the Lord was prescribing things for the Day of Atonement, that the high priest would have to first offer a sacrifice for sins for himself so he could be ritually cleansed to do the work as mediator between God and sinful people he would have to offer that sacrifice first. And then he could offer the sacrifices on behalf of God's people. Jesus comes and He is totally different. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, He has no original sin. And Jesus, throughout His days, keeps God's law perfectly. And from the time that that we see Him here to His relatively silent years between here and the time of His earthly ministry, beginning at age 30. All those silent years, Jesus is doing just what we see Him in this text doing. Keeping God's law to the letter for us on our behalf. And boy, do we ever need it. We need it because we are anything but the perfection that God demands under His law. The law smacks us down. It accuses us. And it does not stop us. Even we who call ourselves Christians and followers of Christ from rising up in arrogance and looking at the law and saying, yep, I'm doing pretty good, God. Aren't you so blessed to have me? Where we want to, because we have this addiction to God's law, that we want to take some credit in some way we want to contribute to our salvation. But God says if we want to try to earn our salvation, we have to be perfect. And His law exposes our sin and its ugliness and our arrogance and our pride time and time again. It exposes the truth that we as children of Adam and Eve, children of that rebellion in Eden, we stage our own rebellions against God and His Word every single day in what we think, in what we say, in what we do. And at every turn where God's law says do this, we don't. And don't do this, and that's what we do. We fail time and again. So we need a Savior to come and to be under that law for us and to be our perfect substitute. We need a Savior who lives up to that name. And that's what we have in Jesus Jesus is under that law perfectly for us. And it doesn't matter which snapshot of His life you look at in the Gospels, you find the same picture of Him being perfect under that law for us. Perfectly obedient to His Father in heaven. Perfectly keeping all of God's law to the letter. To fulfill the old covenant for us, the two-sided law covenant that we could never fulfill in order to establish a new covenant, a one-sided covenant, where God has done all of the work for us and freely by His grace gives us forgiveness and salvation. That's what Jesus is accomplishing. And it doesn't happen right at when He starts His earthly ministry. Okay, now He's starting to do it. It happens when He is a baby. He was sinless from the time He was conceived and He was obedient to the law all of His days for us. But we also know that that wasn't enough. It wasn't enough that Jesus just be under God's law for us, but He had to shed His blood for us as well. And He did that too. We most often think about Jesus doing that at Calvary, don't we? But here, as an eight-day-old infant, Jesus 
spills the first few holy, precious drops of His blood for you and for me. Suffering. Amazing. That Jesus is already doing His work of our salvation. And this is just a portent of things to come. We think of how Christ spilled out that blood for us on the cross, trading His sins, our sins, excuse me, for His perfection. Taking them all away forever by His death on the tree. Jesus, who was sacrificed for us as the once and for all sacrifice for sin. And in grand divine irony here, as Jesus is further being subject to God's law, and He's brought to the temple to be presented to the Lord, as Mary is purified from her ritual uncleanness of childbirth, and Jesus is presented as belonging to the Lord, as every firstborn male in Israel was, He's redeemed. God said that all of the firstborn would belong to Him. And then later He said, well, the Levites will take the place of all the firstborn in Israel. But still, I want every firstborn to be redeemed, a sacrifice to be offered, five shekels to be paid, to be bought back. In divine irony, the Redeemer of the world, the Savior has a sacrifice made on his behalf. A poor man's sacrifice of two turtle doves or two young pigeons. These are, these are not birds of very high value, are they? We've been known to call pigeons rats with wings, right? And here the Savior is redeemed under God's law to be the Redeemer for us. How amazing is that? where Jesus would be the sacrifice for us later on that cross to take away all of our sins after living perfectly under that law to die for all of our sin, for all of our rebellion, for all of our guilt, for all of our law-breaking, Jesus would be crucified for us. And the priest who needed no sacrifice for his own sins because he had not a one would become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And He would rise from death to give us eternal life in heaven. The ultimate high priest and our Savior. Jesus truly lives up to His name. And we find at the end of the chapter, it says, Mary and Joseph did everything according to the law of God. And Jesus did that throughout His days. May God grant us hearts that thank Him each and every day for this gift of His grace that His Son is our brother under the law. That His Son shed His blood for us to redeem us and wash us clean of all of our sins. That His Son prepares our hearts in humble repentance to celebrate His first coming and to look for and long and be confident in Him for His coming again. What a blessing that we know this child who grew up to be our priest. Amen peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
In the closing hours of this day, hear us as we pray, O Lord. For the well-being of people everywhere, for the growth of your church in all the world, and for the strengthening of all who serve and worship here, we pray, O Lord. For one another, young and old, for your blessings that come with every stage of life, and for joy in doing your will, we pray, O Lord. For our public servants who work day and night to bring protection, justice, learning, and health to this and every place, we pray to you, O Lord. For favorable weather and bountiful harvests, for clothing and food, for health of body, mind, and spirit, and for deliverance from all sin and every form of evil, we pray to you, O Lord. For the faithful who have gone before us, who have shared with us your good news, whose souls are now at rest in your heavenly kingdom, we give you thanks, O Lord. In thanksgiving for your many and varied gifts to us, we now commend ourselves to your care. Be our shield and strength, O Lord. And in Jesus' name we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, the peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. According to your word, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for every people. A light to light in the Gentiles, and the glory of your people is. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.